scripture is going to be John 6, 16 through 21. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and went over, over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea draw, and drawing near to the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they willingly uh, received him into the boat. Immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. Thank you, brother, so much. And it's so good to be with you all this morning. And it's such a blessing to be able to come together and worship our God in spirit and in truth and continue our study looking in at the life of of Jesus. Just a few updates and announcements just to make sure everyone's aware. We will have our bros and barbecue this afternoon and we will be deciding what topic and content we want to be studying as we uh, pick back up next year in January. So taking off the month of November and December uh, because of people traveling and holidays and those events and those kinds of things. And so January we will kick off our new content. Uh, you are invited. You are invited. If you are a bro, uh, even if you don't like barbecue, you are invited. We want you to come. Doesn't uh, matter your age. Uh, doesn't matter your your knowledge or your capability. You are invited, and you are welcome, and uh, you are valuable. And we hope that you will attend. And I know the ladies; they have their ladies' lunch and learn. And uh, I don't know the status of the ladies' lunch and learn, but I know that they know it, and they're always on top of it. And the ladies, by the way, are highly engaged and have all kinds of things going on. And so I know the ladies. Uh, would invite those fellow ladies as well to be included in all of their activities. On that note, November the 2nd, we have our fall building and ground cleanup uh, here at the building at 9 a.m. November the 2nd, that's Saturday. And then November the 3rd, we will talk about our next year opportunities and we will plan for next year for 2025. And so we do this and have been doing this now for quite some time. And it's a great opportunity to talk about what's working, what's not working, uh, what could be working in terms of ways that we can be engaged with each other, ways that we can serve one another, fellowship opportunities, service opportunities, evangelism opportunities, and so look forward to that. That will be in between service on November the 3rd. And uh, also just a couple of things coming up. Remember, Steve mentioned this morning, October the 26th at 2 p.m., the New Hope Road congregation will be having their area-wide singing. And so uh, opportunity for you in that respect, plan for that. A great opportunity to get to know other congregations, to get to sing and praise God together uh, with fellow brethren. And uh, by the way, the Habersham congregation, we had an opportunity to involve ourselves with their fall festival Yesterday, uh, it was in the evening time, and it was a great time to be with those brethren, but it's not just the Habersham congregation. There's several other congregations in the area up there, north, more northeastern part of Georgia, uh, that come together for this type of event, but they don't just do it in the fall. They do it on a pretty, pretty regular basis, and so that is a great opportunity, and as those dates and as that information comes out, uh, we will share it with you. And also, we had our Youth Devo that we've been starting to do. Uh, we had it on Friday, and the brother who spoke was 14 years old. His name is Chase Allen. And all I got to say is the future of the Lord's, pr uh, Lord's church is bright. It was excellent to hear his message. Uh, it was extremely encouraging. A young man who is devoted to the Lord, who knows the Bible, who was charging his fellow younger brethren uh, and young people to uh, be provoked in the scripture. Um, very, very encouraging. And uh, it's a great way to get involved not only with the area congregations uh, as they come and attend this youth Devo at our house once a month, but also uh, we have guest speakers that come in uh, from all over. And uh, these young men who are sound, faithful Christians uh, encourage the young people in that respect. This morning, we're looking at, again, the miracles of Jesus and continu continuing on in our study of his life, focusing in on the miracles of Jesus. We looked at the miracles of Jesus as it related to the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Last Sunday and this, this Sunday, this week, uh, we're now looking at the miracles of Jesus as found in the gospel according to John. And in particular, we're focusing in on being uh, unafraid. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And I want you to think about as we open up this study, what you feel like when you're vulnerable. 
and how you behave, how you tend to react, how you tend to um, operate and think and different types of activities you tend to, to find yourself engaging in. Different people act and behave in different ways. Um, you know, some people, they kind of curl up into a ball and they go and hide. Other people, uh, you know, they, they talk a lot. You might know someone who when they're nervous or when they're afraid, they just can't stop talking. And then you got other people who seem to talk all the time, but then when they're nervous and they're afraid, they clam up and they, they can't think of anything to say. We all have different ways that we cope with fear. We all have different ways that we try to navigate through a fearful situation. And, and sometimes what we do, it's pretty common amongst folks, is we kind of get into a control freak mentality. Uh, because there are areas of our life we can't control, and because there's questions and vulnerabilities and different channels and pockets in our life that exist that uh, cause us to, to be fearful, we try to then fixate on things that maybe we can't control or even things that we can't control and try to become overly obsessive in controlling those areas in hopes that oftentimes when we do this subconsciously, that would also be able to control that situation that we are fearful over. Hey, here's the thing. When Jesus came on the scene, he provoked fear. Uh, people became afraid of his <coughs> power. They became afraid of his capability. They became afraid of his sovereignty and of what he represented, God on earth. He didn't just represent it, he is God. And as he was on this earth, he was God on earth, Matthew chapter one. And so we're looking at do not be afraid in the context of Jesus walking on the sea. On the sea. And I want you to, to think about, first of all, uh, ways that maybe you act and behave when you're fearful and how that might translate over into your spiritual life. Number one, don't try to make Jesus something he is not. Uh, when you're afraid, or even just in your general life, when you think about Jesus, don't try to make him something that he is not. And actually, in this context, that is what they're trying to do regarding Jesus. If you look there at John chapter 6, prior to the passage that we began reading, Starting there in verse 16, notice verse 15. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Why isn't Jesus with them initially, the disciples, when they go out onto the sea? Because Jesus departed because the effort by the people were to try to make him something that he is not. And sometimes we try to do this, again, whether or not we're vulnerable and afraid or whether or not we're just living our life and just thinking that we are the ones that are in control of Jesus. By the way, that's the attraction of idolatry. The attraction of idolatry is that, you know what, I get to control, you know, this idol God. And I get to tell this idol God what to do. I get to move this idol God and place this idol God where I want. I'm the one in control of this idol God. So I get to tell the little G God how things work. And sometimes people, practically speaking, try to do that with Jesus. They think they can make Jesus what they want Jesus to be rather than Jesus being who Jesus is. Don't try to make Jesus something he is not. He is not an earthly king. Jesus is not an earthly king. I want you to notice what John tells us regarding the words of Jesus in his exchange with Pilate in John chapter 18. Pilate is asking Jesus his own religious status and again trying to just carry on this dialogue as he has certain authority and power. He says, am I a Jew, a Jew, thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Hey, you're the one being put up uh, for, for trial. You're the one that they're trying to execute. What is it that you've done? What's going on here? Pilate's asking Jesus. And Jesus responds and says there in verse 36, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. You know, Larry in his prayer just a few minutes ago talked about the political climate we're in. And if you just uh, in any way open your phone to any app of any kind, you're going to get bombarded just about with political ads. 
You are being influenced right now to think your purpose in life is to vote. Your purpose in life is this country. Your purpose in life is election 2024 and who the next president will be. Here's the reality. That's not your purpose in life. It's a duty. It's of interest. It's something we need to be mindful of. But Jesus and our spiritual concern is not based upon the physical, political climate. Jesus is not an earthly king. Jesus is also not an arbiter over worldly interests. You know, sometimes people like to use the Bible to justify their own interests. In other words, I'm going to go do and live how I want to live. Then I'm going to engage in what's called eisegesis. Eisegesis means to insert into the scripture what I want the scripture to say. It doesn't have anything to do uh, from the way the word is pronounced regarding Jesus. It doesn't have anything to do with Jesus in terms of the actual understanding of that word. It just means to literally insert one's own will and idea into the text. And that's what people like to do with the Bible. They like to live their life how they want to live it. And then they like to try to use Jesus and try to leverage his status as justification for dealing with their own worldly interests. That's not what Jesus is for. That's not why he came. As a matter of fact, there's even instances that we find in the Scripture of those coming to Jesus asking for this type of Mediation. And in Luke chapter 12, beginning there in verse 13, one of the company says to him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Hey, Jesus, knock my knucklehead brother over the head, please, because I'd like some of that inheritance, and, and please deal with this for me. Jesus says in verse 14, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? Verse 15, Take heed and beware of covetousness for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. That's the scope that Jesus deals with. Jesus deals with the scope of our spiritual status. Sometimes people like to use Jesus and like to try to leverage and invoke Jesus regarding their own physical interests and using Jesus as justification to deal with it. So maybe there's some kind of quibble going on. There's some kind of argument going on. There's some kind of disagreement going on. And guess what? You know what? Uh, because of Jesus, X, Y, and Z. Well, just wait a second now. What's your attitude, so-and-so? What's your own spiritual status, so-and-so? Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. What do you need to do regarding your own life and fixing areas in your own life before you go and start pointing the finger at others? Your effort to try to invoke Jesus needs to likewise be applied to your own life first. Don't try to make Jesus an arbiter over worldly interests. Don't try to make Jesus an adherent to the will of of man. Let's not try to go around and tell Jesus what to do. Jesus' concern is not the will of man. You know, what's so fascinating about the sinner's prayer is not only the fact that it is completely unbiblical, and we find, for example, in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, According to Acts chapter 9, Saul would be found praying. He's on his prayerful knees. And what is he told to do? He's not told to then just say the sinner's prayer as he's in the middle of praying. He's told to rise up off his knees in order to have his sins forgiven by being baptized. Acts 22 and verse 16. But what's so fascinating about the sinner's prayer, this is what the sinner's prayer is. Jesus, I'm going to tell you what to do. Jesus, you come into my heart. And you'll have denominational preachers. You'll have all kinds of religious folks get this idea and proclaim from the pulpit, commanding Jesus what to do. That somehow by making that command and by stating one's own will and desire, that that just means it happens. The concern of Jesus is not our will. It's the Father's. 
And the people, by the way, during the ministry of Jesus recognized this. You find, for example, Mark chapter, Mark chapter 12 and verse 14. And when they were come, they say unto him, Master, we know that thou art true and carest for no man. For thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. Hey, we recognize, Jesus, you're not going around concerned about the interests and the will of man. You're not focused on being an adherent to man's ideas. You don't care about those things. You care about the truth. And so we find then in John's account in chapter 5 and in verse 30 there, Jesus says, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Even Jesus is not concerned about his own will. While he was physically here upon the earth, being 100% God and 100% man, that 100% man, he had temptation continually to put his own will over his father's. But guess what? His purpose is the will of the father. When we are afraid, we might have the hesitancy to make Jesus something he is not. He is not an earthly king. He is not the arbiter of worldly interests. He is not concerned about the will of man and what our own opinions are. He's not. When we're afraid, we might also think, you know, there's that saying, fight or flight. Point number two, sometimes we might try to traverse the channels of life and we might flight, we might flee, we might go on without Jesus. Just because of the status of fear that consumes us. And we see that very thing taking place here in the context of John chapter 6. Notice there, we see where Jesus went, verse 15, verse 16, and when even was now come, his disciples went down unto the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark and Jesus was not come to them. Now, whether or not this was the right thing or wrong thing to do is, is, is not really the point. The point for our practical application is, Sometimes when we're about to traverse some aspect of our life, we leave Jesus behind. We just go on and do what we want to do, and we're not really concerned about Jesus coming along with us and consulting the will of God. And we understand that the Scripture teaches otherwise. For example, Paul tells us plainly in Colossians chapter 3 and in verse 17 that whatever we do in word or deed, we are to do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. We likewise find in the book of James concerning things that we might want to do in this life, what do we need to do first? We need to consult with the will of God. James says in verse 13, Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. And so prior to engaging in some kind of endeavor, prior to uh, going about my life and uh, either because of flight as it relates to fear or whether it just be because I have plans. Guess what I need to do? I need to consult with the will of God. If the Lord wills, this is what I intend to do. However, I'm saying if the Lord wills, not just because that's a southern phrase, but because in actuality I am prayerfully consulting God in that respect. I'm mindful of His sovereignty. I'm mindful of His power. The Hebrews writer tells us in Hebrews chapter 13 and in verse 5 that our lifestyle, the King James Version uses the word conversation, it needs to be without covetousness. We need to be content with such things that we have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. If we feel the need to grasp hold onto physical things, if we feel the need to, you know what, in order to find comfort, I just need to, you know, I need to just go on and do what I want to do. And forget Jesus, forget the will of God, forget the church. <laughs> That's not my concern. I got to take care of me. Uh, that's, not, that's not the way we need to be living our lives. Jesus needs to be with us every step of the way. 
we're afraid. We don't need to try to make Jesus something He is not. We don't need to traverse the channels of life without Him. Point number three, our final point, we don't need to be afraid of the power of Jesus. If you look there at the context, you notice their reaction concerning what it is that they see in John chapter 6. Beginning there in verse 18, the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about five and 20 or 30 furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship and they were afraid. They see Jesus, but they're afraid. Why? Jesus says to them, it is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. You know, sometimes when we get into that control freak mentality, it is a fearful thing regarding the inability to control what's before us. I've told y'all, and it's kind of a joke now, of course the, the Tierces are experts at flying, but not me. Carol figured it out in just a couple flights, man. She's, she said, I'll go on a flight anytime. Probably one of the reasons she was so concerned about whether or not she'd survive is because of my illustrations up here in the pulpit, but I, I don't like flying. And one of the reasons I don't like flying is guess what? <laughs> I don't know what that pilot's doing up there. I have no idea what's going on. All I know is I'm 30,000 feet in the air in a tin can. I'm not in control. I'm concerned. I don't know about you, but I don't like surgery. I don't like the idea of laughing gas. I don't like the idea of being put under. I don't like the idea of anesthesia. I don't like someone who, yes, may have my best interests in heart, but guess what? Able to take total control over whether or not I continue to exist. That's a terrifying thought to me. You know, our autonomy is something that's important. And what's happening when Jesus is carrying out his ministry upon the earth, what's happening is mankind is seeing his power. They're witnessing and visualizing and dwelling upon who is amongst them. And there's a recognition that Jesus is unlike any other that's ever walked upon earth. And has power that no other has ever had. And what does that do? You might think, but some of these are good things. I mean, there was a storm. Aren't they thankful to see Jesus? I might have some kind of disease that a surgery needs to be performed. Guess what? <laughs> I'm still not going to be raising my hand excited about being put under and being operated on. It's a fearful thing to yield one's autonomy. That's scary. I want you to look at an account with me in Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, let's begin there in verse 2. And I want you to notice here as we go through this account, the way in which the people comprehend the power of Jesus. Mark chapter 5, beginning there in verse 2, and when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. And so this is like a Jacob Marley, if you're familiar with uh, Christmas Carol. And the scenes of Jacob Marley coming to Ebenezer Scrooge. And what has he got all on him? He's got chains and he's shackled. That's kind of the picture that we gain here. 
Why do all these shackles exist? Why do all these chains exist? Because the people are terrified of this individual and they've been dealing with this for some time and have tried to restrain him. And what is he doing? He's just living about the tombs. Cutting himself. Walking around with shackles that have now been disbanded somehow and is still out on the loose. This area was well aware and fearful of this lunatic. He sees Jesus afar off, verse 6. He runs and worships Him. And He cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him saying, send us to the swine that we might enter in them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. And so this individual who was demon-possessed with a legion of demons has now been set free. Because of the power of Jesus, not only over the physical, we noted John chapter 6, verses 16 through 21, walking on the water. We noticed last week his healing of the paralytic. We understand that Jesus throughout his ministry did many signs and wonders and miracles, all of which now have ceased. We no longer have miracles that occur any longer. Why? Because the word of God has been confirmed. Mark chapter 16 and verse 20, 1 Corinthians 13, 8 and following. But all of those things were recorded. Why? So that we could believe in Jesus. Jesus has the power over the physical. But what else does he have the power over? This context here in Mark chapter 5 shows us he has the power over the spiritual realm. And Jesus has now released this individual from the bondage of these demons, these unclean spirits that were tormenting him to the point where 2,000 swine then had the demons come into them and ran off the mountain and died. And so we see in verse 14, those that fed the swine fled. And they told it in the city and in the country. And when they went out to see what it was that had happened, then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. I have a question. Is that a good thing? Is the fact that this individual has now been released from this demon possession and is no longer plagued with this legion of unclean spirits and is now in his right mind, is no longer in a status of lunacy? What an amazement! But the end there... Verse 15 says, they were afraid. Verse 16, and those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. Why? Why? we can't comprehend your power. We've tried everything we possibly can to solve this problem, and we couldn't do it. And you show up and immediately are able to cure and obviously have power not only over the physical but over the spiritual. We can't cope. Depart. Are you afraid of letting Jesus into your life? Are you afraid of Jesus changing your life? 
Well, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want Jesus to change that. Now, wait a second now. Wait a second. Wait a second. I like my routine. I like my schedule. I have my way of doing things. No, no, no. Jesus, I'm not letting you into my calendar. Then I don't have autonomy. Whoa, Jesus, I'm not letting you into my phone. I'm not letting you into my phone and influencing which apps I get on and which apps I download and which apps I engage with. I'm not allowing that. Whoa, Jesus, no. I'm not letting you into my budget. I want the control over these things. Depart. How many of us were looking into the perfect law of liberty? <laughs> Acknowledge, you know what? I'm afraid of the power of Jesus. I'm afraid of the changes that will happen in my life if I actually yield myself over to him and allow him to complete me and allow him to lead me, fix me, cleanse me, comfort me, care for me, direct me. Friends and brethren, at one point or another, we will all acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus Christ. God has given us the opportunity now by our autonomy, by our own will to decide and say, I want to make Jesus my Lord. Not just by being baptized into water then walking out and doing whatever I want to do. No, by changing my life. Yes, by being saved, by being immersed in water, 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, but afterward then living a life devoted where Jesus is in control. A lot of people don't want that. A lot of people do not like that idea. They like their own Sunday mornings, Sunday afternoons the way they like them. They like their own Wednesday nights the way they like them. They like their own routines the way they like them. They like their own... Priorities the way they like them. And just as we see in Mark chapter 5, the idea that Jesus would enter in and with power change their life. No, 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 no. Depart to another region. <laughs> now here at this congregation, what do we want? Do we want Jesus? Here. Here. Do we want to allow Jesus, the will of the Father, the gospel, to direct and guide our lives to eternity? To provoke us, to change us, to save us. Only He has that power. And it is only through Him that we can go to the Father. John 14 and verse 6. Where do you stand this morning? Brother or sister, if you need prayers of the congregation, if you need to be restored, if there's any way that we can help you and encourage you, we hope that you'd make that known and we want to be there for you. We're in this together. <laughs> what a blessing it is to be a member of the body of Christ and to be able to have one another, to bear one another's burdens and to press on together encouraging one another to that upward home. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not yet a child of God. You've not yet made the decision to be saved, to be baptized, buried in water for the forgiveness of your sins based upon your belief and confession in Christ. It is at that point that one then becomes a child of God. Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27. Acts chapter 8, 34 through 39. Have you done that yet this morning? If not, you have the opportunity to do so. If you have any spiritual need, don't be afraid. Please come forward as all together we stand and sing.